I'm just going to read this. I said, you know, even every validation you get in the earth from man or from your accolades or, um, you know, things that you've done, uh, you know, your successful endeav endeavors or achievements, they're great. They're good. And, and they build a certain confidence in people, don't they? But really, all those things, you'll have to keep looking for those naturally. You'll have to keep striving for those, um, you know, to validate yourself, right? So what I was sharing was this. I said, all those things are just temporal things. They're all temporal validations, and they eventually go away. Do you know that? They eventually go away. Knowing who you are in Christ will, will make you confident, resourceful, strong, in purpose and direction. I'm not reading from the word. I'm just reading something I wrote. Make no mistake. The devil is a mastermind at deceiving and distorting. Do you understand that? The devil is a mastermind setting people up. He's been around a long time. He sets people up quickly. He deceives them. He distorts them. He leads them astray. The only reason you're not led astray is because you stay in fellowship with the spirit. You stay in communion with your partnership, with your commitment with Jesus, with the body of Christ. Even people go, well, I'm at home reading my Bible. They're deceived. I know people that say, well, I don't go to church. All church people are hypocrites. I was like, no, mm -mm, that's not true at all. See, if people that say that, I don't go to church because everybody's a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. Who's the biggest hypocrite? The ones that they are. Yeah. They're yeah. the biggest hypocrite. They go, I don't yeah. go to church and everybody's a hypocrite. No, they don't go to church because... They don't want a commitment. No. Nope. They don't want to have to give. No. Nope. Their time, their energy, their finances. Uh, you know, and they themselves uh, usually are takers. There's only how many understand what I mean. People uh -huh. aren't doing for me, so they're all hypocrites, right? That's that's, that's silliness, they right? Don't the they don't want to hear the truth, of course. Because men love darkness, you can't handle the truth, right? Yeah, you can't handle. It. So <laughs> this is how this is this is just how I like to talk. I'm I'm an old, lonely kind of guy. I don't want to hear a couple little sermons about how Jesus wants to give you a hug. See, because when you when you live like that, and then you go out of here, you're not a person of principle. You have to become like Brother Hagin used to say, principles that govern the realm of the spirit. If you don't become a, a mechanic in the realm of the spirit, understanding principles, you'll just live outside like the world and you'll tell everybody you're a Christian. But the principles won't govern your life. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And the principles, like even prosperity, we shouldn't depend upon our, our own just work. We're depending upon a supernatural resource and supply. How many understand? Our confidence mm -hmm. isn't in the flesh. All right. So Ephesians 1, let me read it to you in the Amplified. Uh, verse 4. <laughs> Since you always ask what the verse says. <laughs> even as in his love, Every say, in his, in his love. He chose you. He picked you out for himself as his own before the foundation of the world. So you'd be consecrated, set apart, right? You would be uh, committed in partnership, blameless in his sight, above reproach. That means when everybody else finds fault with you, God don't. Right, right. People are going to find fault with you, man, in life. That's true. Do you know that? People find fault with me. So what? And here's what you got to be careful of. People are going to find fault in you because God created you as something different. And, and I'm not saying you're right all the time. But your personality is your personality. And who you are, you know, is who you are. And so uh, people will find fault in you. But here's the reality. If you know who you are in Christ, you won't try to fix yourself so that everybody likes you. Mm. They like me. See, you'll have to be phony then. I'd rather not be phony and be who I am. Do you know what I'm saying? Now, that don't mean you can't temper yourself down. See, here's the thing. You got to know when to temper yourself and when you can let your real self out. Mm-hmm. You get my point? Yeah. Some people can't have, you can't, you just, because of the way they're built, because of the, let's see, yeah. <laughs> the Holy Spirit just said, 
I'll say, Holy Spirit didn't say that. Yeah, it's true. Because of the phoniness in them, they're not in a place mentally and emotionally and spiritually, so to speak, to allow you to be you. You understand? Uh -huh. You can just be you. You should be able to let people be them and not be bothered by it. You can let somebody be who they are, meaning their quirks and whatever. Now, now what I'm talking about as a Christian, right? Not everybody has to walk like you, talk like you, act like you, dress like you, think like you. As long as they have Christ on the inside, they're not compromised there. You know what I mean? They're not compromised in integrity or in understanding of who they are in Christ, right? Mm -hmm. You got to, and people have different, you know, some people don't like basketball. Some people, you know, don't like baseball, you know, some people like, don't like football, you know, whatever. I mean, that's just a, a selective choice that you and I have, right? Or they don't like certain foods. So you got to let them be them. Like, if you say, like me, I don't like curry. Well, I've had people before, what, what do you mean you don't like curry? Didn't you hear what I said? I don't like curry. Are you okay with that? That's just the way it is. I mean, Sorry. I don't need your validation. It's okay. I guess I'm going to start having to eat curry now. So you like me. You don't like ice cream. I don't get upset. What do you mean you don't like vanilla? That's my favorite. <laughs> you know what? I'm so serious. It's like vanilla is my favorite. You know, so because we, because human nature is so selfish, you think everybody likes what you like. Mm -hmm. Now, as long as they're a sold out, committed, on fire, a Holy Ghost believer, that's all that really matters in the long run. All the other stuff is just, what do you mean you don't like ketchup or mayonnaise? What, what do you, there's people like that, man, and they force you. And they're not spiritual. They're locked into the world. I don't really care what you eat. Burger, this burger, that burger, that fry, that fake. I don't, I'm not <laughs> preaching doctrines of food. I preach eternal things. Right, How many right. understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. No, you know. So it says right here, it says, he picked you out for himself, constantly set you by above reproach, before him in love. So you got to remember, you're before him in love. And this is what you have to let recognize when you look in the mirror, man. And, and every day when you're establishing this, the phoniness goes away, man. The fraudulence of life that that what happened when Adam sinned, all the fraudulence comes. How many understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you try to find the approval of the unapproved. And the unapproved are all the ones that are unapproved to God. The serious, the unapproved. And what, how do you know they're unapproved? Because they live contrary to God's word. They walk in darkness. They don't walk in the light as he is in the light. So they live contrary. So they're not validated. Matter of fact, if you look at when it came to Cain and Abel, what did God tell Cain? What it was one of the things God told Cain? He says, if you will do what? If you'll do what's right, you'll be approved. Approved. Right? You want me to read it to you? And, and uh, it's in uh, Genesis 4, verse 5 through 8, I believe. Uh, Cain brought an offering. Cain was angry and indignant. He looked sad and depressed. And, and the Lord said, Cain, what's wrong with you? <laughs> like God didn't know. God asks you questions, so you start thinking about what the problem is. Why are you angry? Because Cain thought the problem was somebody else, didn't he? Cain thought the problem was who? Hey, come on now, let's 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 excavate this. We're in church now. Let's heck with, right. Let's learn. Cain thought who was the problem? Abel. Yeah. Why was Abel the problem? Because Abel was being blessed. So Cain was teed off. And he said, and the Lord said, "Why are you angry? Uh, and why do you look sad and depressed and dejected?" Now, let me ask you this. Why was he sad? Why was he depressed and dejected? Because he wasn't doing what was right. Was he? No, he wasn't. He was doing his own program. Right. See, when it comes to the earth, 
When it comes to the earth, you can do your own program, like Pizza Hut, Pasquale's, Straw Hut, uh, Domino's, uh, you know, what's the other one? That, 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 uh, okay. Little Caesar. Yeah. You can do your own program there. But when it comes to eternal things, you can't do your own program. You, you can't. Now we realize you have the choice to reject God's program. So in that sense, you can do what you want. But just in a general way, if you want to prosper, flourish, thrive, if you want to walk in victory, you've got to tap into his program. How many understand what I'm saying? But but in the earth, you can you can go Giants, A's, uh, you know, Tigers, Yankees. I wore a Yankees hat. And the guy goes, You a Yankee fan? I was like, no, but nostalgia, man. I like, I like, and then he was like, I grew up in the Bronx. We're talking the other day across the street. And he's like, uh, he's an older guy, business guy. And he's like, yeah, man, uh, my dad used to go over there for, for Mickey Mantle and all this. And I, I was like, oh, I've been to the stadium. It was great. So you can, you can do what you desire in that realm. So I think I made my point. But he goes right here to Cain. He goes, uh, if, verse 7, you do well. This is interesting. If you do well, will you not be accepted? Will you not be validated, approved, recognized? Will you not? See, here's the problem we got. We got all kind of people in the body of Christ. And I'm going to make it more, bring it on home to San Francisco. They want the approval of the earth. But they want to go to church. But they want the approval of the, the unapproved. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. The unapproved were like Cain. Yeah. They were created naturally by God, but spiritually, they're not validated. There's no fingerprint on their life, so okay. to speak. Now, of course, a lot of people say, that's judging. I'm going to teach a, ser a sermon coming up. I got want to study for it about what, what is judging. People are like, don't judge me. You know the Bible calls you to judge? I told you to judge. You just don't have the right to judge something eternally. You know, you don't have the right to condemn somebody, but you can judge things, right? Um, I saw this little thing this morning, uh, this little video, and it's like, don't judge. Now, this has happened to me, not this exact scenario, but in small ways, it's happened to you. Uh, except this one was the guy bought a box of cookies at the airport. He sits down at a table, there's a gentleman across from him. Who he reaches over and grabs a cookie. He's thinking, oh, what's he doing? Grab my cookie. This gentleman grabs a cookie, he eats cookie. The other guy grabs another cookie, he eats cookie. Christian, there's only one cookie left. The guy across him grabs a cookie, breaks it apart, says, gives it to him, and then they, they eat, he's eating the cookie. And, and then the other guy that's across picks up the cookie jar, grabs it, walks off, throws it in the trash, and leaves. The guy that's sitting there is still stewing, thinking what? <laughs> he ate half my cookies. Mm -hmm. well, it's not, it's he, just it. he just reached in and grabbed it without asking, how dare him, but he didn't want to say anything. He didn't want to create a, a commotion. So then he went to move his bag, and guess what was underneath his jacket? His bag of cookies. His box of cookies. Wow. His box of cookies. And he thought, wow. The whole time I've been here sitting there, big guy dude was eating my cookies, but I was eating his cookies. <laughs> <laughs> and you got to be careful in life because wow. the small little yeah. things like that happen. Yeah. Right? You know, I, I, I had something happen like that once or twice with driving. You know, or whatever the case is. So that's why the, the key is to condition your mind not to make a judgment right away. How many understand what I'm saying? Be Amen. quick. Amen. Be quick to get all. But that's kind of funny, man, because I was like, wow, that's happened to me, not with a cookie, but with something else. You have preconceived, you're thinking, man, and then all, you know, you just your emotions, your fireworks yeah. shoot off, and you're thinking, man, that dude's eating all my cookies. What a blah, 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 blah. And the reality is, is, they didn't. So you got to make sure because the devil will come. And why does that happen? Let me, and then we're going to get back to this. Why did he have all those thoughts, those feelings, those emotions? Why were they all firing off? 
There's only one reason. Why? Come on. Me, myself, and I, but there's, there's only one reason scripture. Fear. There's, there's, there's no fear in love, man. Even if that dude was stealing his cookie, a real mature person would have, would have just said, have some more. Mm -hmm. But the, the fear of you're taking from me, you're keeping, you're which is true, he, he could be stealing. But once again, that gets down to deciphering some things like a cookie, go ahead. You know? It's not going to kill you, is it? No. So that's why Jesus said, um, if, if uh, a guy says, forces you to go, you know, whatever, mile, one mile or two miles, go the extra mile. He's talking about love. But it's not about that guy. It's about the condition of your heart not being defiled or twisted or distorted. Mm -hmm. See, staying free. See, you and I have to learn to stay free from all the in, in, uh, integral is the word I'm looking for. Integral workings of the flesh, the spirit realm, and just the consortment of other people, ideologies, and all kinds of things that come in and try to twist you. So to stay free is important because mm -hmm. there's all kinds of things pulling you in, a box of cookies, pulling you into a mode of a $5 box of cookies or you walking with a root of bitterness. Which one's seen? If you don't see that, you'll be all pissed off by a $5 box of cookies. That's right. Now, some of this you learn in life. You just do it through experience. How important is it? Yeah. How important is it, right, to sacrifice the, the union you have with the Lord to be right? You get my point? Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a very interesting, and a lot of people they're not they're not they're not uh, they don't use their tools, so they just go to church and they go practice love. Break it down for me. How do you practice love? I just showed you one way. When you value maintaining your unity with God rather than trading it for a bowl of porridge like Esau. Because mm -hmm. remember, there's always a trade-off. If you're willing to get in the flesh over something earthly, that shows you a level of maturity you have. It's not that that what is earthly isn't important. But what's more important is this, is the value and the, the glory and the presence of God that you have. Mm -hmm. Because every time the devil can get a chink in there, how many mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. Every time he can find a little crack and chop away at, at your oak tree and try to take yeah. a chunk out over what? A $5 a, a ticket somebody put on your car? Mm -hmm. You See, you got to learn, man. And it takes sometimes some failure, it's sad to say. Yeah, yeah. But you learn and you repent. Thank God for the blood. You're restored right back. Hmm. Talking about walking in love. So Cain right here, he says, if you do well, wouldn't you be accepted? And if you don't do well, well, look what he said. Sin crouches at your door. Yeah. It's desires for you, but you what? Hmm. Go ahead and master that thing. So the reality is, is church is not just you dismissing away the challenges, saying God loves me. See, this is what Cain did. Cain did this right here. Here's what Cain did. Cain, Cain dismissed it. God spoke to him, called him to accountability. Now, religious people, he was called to accountability and righteousness. Look, move away from all that. He was called to spiritual union with God and accountability about his walk. Right, right. But he didn't want to hear that. He didn't want the correction. He didn't want the instruction. So what he did, he religiously dismissed it away and went, well, hold on a second. God, am I my brother's keeper? Read it. If you guys can't see that, I don't know. Yeah. So a lot of people, they want to make, it, it's like getting a religious tip. It wasn't about religion here. This was about God calling him to spiritual maturity 
to walk in a place of validation before his, before God. That's what he said. But sin is right here. The problem's not me, Cain. The problem's not me. The problem's not Abel. The problem's not your environment. The problem is sin is crouching at your door now, looking to pull you out, looking to bait you in to a place of devastation, death, and harm for not only yourself, but for others. That's it. Sin is looking. And behind that sin is the puppeteer and master himself, Satan, going like this. Look at what the poor is. And most Christians just, they get pulled in and they just go, oh, God loves me. He's like, no, no, hold on a second. God does love you, but what he tells you here, are you approved? Well, you're approved in Christ, but what you need to do is reconcile your words, excuse me, let me say this correctly, your thoughts, words, and actions with who you are in Christ. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts, your words, and your actions with who you are in Christ. Amen? Amen. There in your validation goes into operation. Mm -hmm. See, I mean, you're our, you and I are accepted in Christ. But why is it so many believers there weak in this area? Why? Because as I said, they go to church rather than being a practicer of principle. And of divine laws. How many understand? There's laws that govern you as a Christian. There's laws, man. You've got to start. No, I'm not saying you. You've got to be a thinker. Why is it everybody else wants to be a strategist and a great thinker? I mean, you're going to go in the stock market. You better do some studying, some research, and some thinking. Mm -hmm. Well, if you want to operate as a, as, a, as a victorious Christian, you're going to have to put some time in learning principles. You're going to have to learn about the realm of the spirit. You're going to have to learn about things. The law of the spirit of life. The law of seed time and harvest. The law of love. The law of giving and receiving. There's laws, man. That you and I have to renew our mind to understand. So that we don't operate out of a secular or natural way. How many understand what I'm saying? Amen. Like I was sharing with these people the other night, it's like one group over here. It's like I don't waste my time telling a lot about stories of the past. Stories of the past are only good to share with newer folks. I share progression. What are you progressing in today? What revelation is God speaking? What is He doing in your life today? What What is He doing? You know, what is he, what truths are being let out, right? And I was, as a matter of fact, someone challenged me yesterday. I go, man, you're always trying to challenge another pastor. And, and he's over there. You're always trying to challenge me, man. Look, dude, that's kibbles. Don't waste my time, you know? And I'm serious. And what I mean by that is this, is like he's telling me about, you know, some, uh, the word of God or something. And, and I don't know, it's like borderline, you know, you get caught up in pride or something. It's like, it's like somebody trying to educate you you know, on something they just learned. Like, like, I've been telling you that for like 20 years, man. And now you want to come and try to educate me. It's not about look how great I am, but it's like, really? That shows how dumb you are. Like, you rather should be saying, hey, you know what you were telling me for the last 20 years? The light bulb finally went on. But instead, many people come to you and they want to tell you about what was just revealed to them, not realizing that you've already been in that for 20 years. You get my point? Uh -huh. Like, and then, and then you're just thinking, that's good. I'm glad you're excited about it, but it's like, that's like elementary, dude. Mm -hmm. No, I'm serious. There's certain things that are elementary in life. You get my point? They're just elementary, you know, just kindergarten. So, and especially some preachers, they didn't even get past kindergarten. I'm not talking about regular people, I'm talking about some preachers. They are not past kindergarten yet. They can even have a big, like a lot of people in their church, but they're not past kindergarten. They are not. I promise you. You want to know why? It's like I said to this guy the other day. He's a good dude. He graduated from Cal Burke and everything else. And I said, hey, that book I gave you, did you ever, did you ever read that? But he's a Christian. He's read a couple of things. But I said, look, 
Just like I told my own son, Caleb. I said the other night, Caleb, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm reading the Bible. I'm like, what are you reading? And he told me, oh, he's reading something in Luke. I said, oh, that's great. I said, well, let me swing you a book over there, you know, by Brother Mark on In Christ. He's like, why would I want to read that book? I got the Bible. And what I said to him, I said, son, if you don't understand that, you can never understand the Bible. You can never understand the Bible. If you don't understand God's work of redemption in Christ, if you don't have a working revelation of that, you don't understand anything. And then I actually even mentioned uh, Maria the other day because she showed that book on, she's looking at Brother Mark's book on Paul's system of truth. So if you don't understand, right, who you are in Christ in that book, you don't, then what will happen is you'll read something in the Old Testament and you'll try to preach it and you can preach the principle of it. Listen, the principle, but that principle must fit into a working functional structure. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You can pull this out of this area, right? Or this scripture, this truth, and it'll work for you principally. But if you don't understand the whole picture, you miss everything, right? You miss the whole thing. And that's what I was sharing with Caleb. And as the reality is God's gifted some people to be able to have an understanding of the whole picture. And if not, you'll just think like Jesus. Like most people think Jesus, here, here's a good example. This brother didn't show up today. And we're talking about, he, was, he asked me today, that the people from the church want to feed the poor. I said, well, it's kind of like a last notice or this and that. And I was like, okay. But, you know, I'll ask anyway. But, but do you know in America, feeding the poor is a lot different than feeding the poor in Jesus' days? Do, do you know that? Mm -hmm. So yeah. when, when, the, when the Bible says in Matthew 5, blessed are the poor in spirit, what does that mean? Blessed are the poor in spirit. It's, it, that, that's all humanity. The broken in spirit, not talking about poor people. So, and when it says Jesus fed the poor, what did the poor look like? Who were the poor? Everybody. Was it was it homeless people that are drug addicts that the city already gives tons of money? Do you know in San Francisco? Do you know there, there's not any poor people? Do you know that? There's no poor people in San Francisco. There's no I don't care what you say. There are no poor people in San Francisco. There's poor people in Hyderabad, India. There's poor people in Africa. There ain't no poor people in San Francisco. They're getting paid by the they're getting paid by the government. They got cell phones. They live in a tent. They got a tent. There's toilets that are set up right near their tent. The city affords uh, those, you know, those takeout toilets. Or porta potties. Porta potties, thank you. Uh, there's so many places to go eat in San Francisco. Do you know that? Yeah. I'm not kidding. Yeah, there's yeah. so many. There's food banks galore. You can line yeah. up here, line up there. So there's no poor people in San Francisco. Don't be deceived. Okay? There's not. Okay. You might find somebody that's lacking, you know, and there and, and it's a lot of people you see you're talking about homeless. So let me just tell you this. So when you look at the Bible and you read, I'll read it to you. You know when it says poor saints? You hear the word? Poor what? Poor who? Saints. When Paul took up the collection for the poor who? Saints. saints. That meant they were part of the family of God. Uh -huh. They were families. They were individuals that were believers that were struggling because of a, a, a what do you call it? A, a, a drought and all kinds of other things. So Paul took up a collection in Macedonia. To bring to Jerusalem. They were poor saints. They weren't just homeless people living everywhere, right? Devouring all the resources. Now, even, come on, even, thank God for the Holy Ghost, even Peter and John by the temple gate, beautiful. There was a beggared man, a poor man sitting at the gate. So if Jesus' ministry was just feed the poor, then Peter was living contrary to that. 
Because when the poor man was sitting there, Peter said, gold and silver have I none. But Peter had gold and silver, didn't he? Yeah. He wasn't Peter, one broke. They, Jesus had a, a Judas who kept taking Paul. So, so it wasn't about feeding the poor, just feeding people hot dogs and hamburgers or whatever. That's not what Jesus did. And even when the 3,000 people and the 5,000 were with Jesus, Jesus was more inclined to teach the word to them for three days before he was to give them a meal. Right, right. Now, a lot of Christians wouldn't like that. It doesn't matter what we want. It matters what scripture says, and it matters about the heart of God. Jesus found it more necessary to feed you spiritually rather than stuff a hamburger down your throat. But we have lots of churches in America that are nothing wrong. I'm not saying that. There's nothing wrong with that. But that is not Jesus' first heartbeat to say, let me get a burger in your mouth, Bernie. Let me get something to feed you first. Jesus' first ministry is to feed you living manna. Mm -hmm. So you can receive that and transform and come up out of that pit. Matter of fact, the prodigal son that was in the pit, did the father run out and say, I know you're starving because I can see you're eating the husks of pigs. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. He, he, he spent all his money. He was living with the pig, eating their husks. The father never ran there and go, oh my God, let me feed you. You, you look hungry. Hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong, and, and it should be done. But, but the main objective is to get the word and the message out, the revelation of God's love and fact of redemption. A lot of Christians think because they don't know the word, they just do all kinds of things without being led or without the word. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I mean, you know, not, you know, it's just like evangelism. Let's go out today. So you, it's better to be led by God's spirit. Amen? Amen. And just do something religiously. Mm -hmm. That's religion. Mm -hmm. So we see here with Cain, and we're going to go back to the piece. He says, but with Cain, uh, he says, if you do well, uh, would you not be accepted? Now, back to Ephesians. Look what he says, 1-4. Now we're going to look at, we're going to cruise on over in another part of Ephesians. I'm going to show you. So be careful that you're not looking. I'm not trying to find this part where John says right here. If I can find this, where you have to believe you like John five, I think it is. Come on, say. Oh, okay. You, in, in a, just let me show you this last one. Go to this one as far as I'm approved. Go to John five. It must be John five. That's what Jesus said. John 5, go to John 5. We're going to start with verse 39. Is anybody getting anything today? Yeah. Uh -huh. John 5. I just want you to see God, Jesus loves everybody. But Jesus is not just this handout guy. Like, oh my God, you're so hungry here. Oh, here, you need this. This is not Jesus. Jesus, look at Jesus expects a partnership, a commitment, a sacrifice on your behalf. He expects a compromise. He expects a trust, right? He expects a communication. Jesus never releases something just to do. There's nowhere in the Bible you see that. Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. I don't care who said it. Look and read the gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Jesus never responded unless somebody responded to him first. The leper came down from the mountain and said, if thou wilt, thou can make me clean. The centurion came to Jesus and said, my servant lies home sick of a palsy, grievous storm. He says, I'll come and heal. The Canaanite woman came to Jesus and said, my daughter, Jesus said, sorry, I can't take the, the children's bread and give it to the uh, dogs. True, but the crumbs fall. Great is your faith, woman. Where is that? You never see Jesus just walk over. Oh my God, there's a sick person there. Let me heal it. You never see that. There's nowhere in the Bible, this is faith. This is fraudulent. Jesus demands that you come into partnership by faith and trust. He demands faith. That's the only thing he requires of you. He requires that you depend and have faith. He never just releases even grace. Grace was God's gift to you. You have to respond. For by grace you're saved through faith. Through faith. Through faith. Grace doesn't work without faith. But people just say, oh, God will do whatever. God will not do whatever. You have to trust him. You have to choose, seek, 
earth the kingdom of God. And then and his righteousness, and then all other things are added to you. But, but why didn't it just say, why didn't it say, God will add all these things to you? And then you'll see. <laughs> or how about uh, if I just said this? Fine. It'll be open. You'll receive. It's ask, you shall receive. Yeah. And knock. And the door will be open. It's open. Seek and you'll find. Why did why did Jesus put an emphasis on you and not on him? He never said, you'll find. I'll come. Uh, you know, it'll be open. Uh, you know, you know, uh, you'll receive. Mm -hmm. Is not Jesus's language. There is a, an expectation that the Father God and Jesus has towards you and I to respond. That's why it says, "Without faith, it's impossible to please Him." Without Hebrews eleven six, why? Because he that comes to Him must what? Believe in you. Wait, wait, hold on a second. Do what? I mean, this is insanity. Just to even think that. Believe what? Believe you. Couldn't he say something more spiritual than that? <laughs> Couldn't God the Father have like something way more spiritual than believe that he is? Why is that so elementary? Why is that so just bare bones? Because it's not bare bones, is it? It's not really that elementary at all. Because a lot of people don't really believe he is. And then that he's a rewarder of those that what? That what? Diligently. Diligence. Not casually. Not once in a while. Not when you're locked up trying to pray a prayer to get out of jail. It's not a monopoly card. <laughs> Diligently. Diligently see him. Right, right. He's a what? Rewarder. <laughs> Seeking you'll find. Knocking it'll be open. Ask you shall receive. Why? Because those are the people that believe he is. Not everybody believes he is, even if they're in church. Mm -hmm. Even Thomas. Jesus said, How long have I been with you? And you still don't know him. It's possible that people can be in church and not know him. They can know a lot about religion. They can know about, about a lot about a worship team. They can know a lot about the pastor. Well, the pastor likes football. They can know a lot about everything else. History, but may never know him. Mm -hmm. There's a problem in America today. Mm -hmm. and someone says, why address America? Because it's by addressing what goes on in the rest of the church is where you and I have to choose not to be like. We're not to be like that. We're to be like the word teaches. We're to follow him according to his, his way, his instruction, right? When it comes to earthly things, choose what pizza you like. But when it comes to heavenly system, adapt yourself. Amen? Mm -hmm. Adapt yourself and then it'll work right. Just like I told my son Caleb, adapt yourself to what I tell you. Here's a good example. Something I said yesterday to him. You know, he broke his foot riding his dirt bike. And then uh, I said, oh, where's the, your brother? They said, oh, he took the dirt bike out. And then I said to him, oh, really? That's good. And then he says, listen, now, I'm going to show you. Just try to hear this. He says, I'm done with dirt bikes. I said, really? No, now, you know, I've been talking to him about commitment to his game. Okay. And so I said, well, sell that dirt bike. He said, I'm done with dirt bikes now. I'm done with all that. I said, cool. Oh, wow. Well, sell it to your brother then. Since you're done. Now, now understand. See, now we're all done means done, doesn't it? Right, right, right. Then, then get rid of the evidence. Yeah, right. Sell it. He's like, well, yeah, but, you know. Oh, well, you told me you were done. Which is it? So here's where me, Pastor Dave, has a different mindset than many people. 
and, and I hope you have the same, but but see, I'm not one that says I'm done and I'm still fiddling around around schedule, right? See, and there, what you have with a lot of Christians in America, they say Jesus is Lord, but they're still fiddling around with other religions, with the world, with everything else. And so then they wonder why I'm not getting that power. Why I'm not, man, why I'm not getting that anointing? Why I'm not experiencing that favor? Why? Because first, the kingdom. And so here's where it gets down to. Here's where it gets down to. I told them, lose the fear of attachment. I said, listen to your father. I made mistakes because of the fear of attachment. Yeah. But I can look back now and think, Ooh, I ain't doing that no more. So if I can help someone learn the fear of missing out or the fear of attachment, get rid of stuff. Right, right. Some relationships you got to sift. You do. You just got to get rid of them. Because they're weighing you down. They're, they're, they're drainers. If they've been going on for a long time and they're draining and draining, and I, I'll keep it real with you, I don't believe, I don't, and I, I would never tell anybody to, like my friend, I told them, hey, we're working on that marriage. I would never tell anyone to leave a marriage because that marriage, is there's soundness there. But there are some marriages that are just full of strife, they're full of vileness, that, that, that is not God's plan. If you're, if you're on a, a, a sports team and there's just a bunch of vileness and corruption going on, don't stay on it. Go. Detach. But see, the devil keeps people in the fear of, well, if I don't stay with this, I might miss out. No, you won't. The Father, God's plan never fails. Mm -hmm. There's right. so much more. But see, you know, there's so much more that he has. Don't limit the Father. Mm -hmm. You just sometimes, before you leave the brook, he died to get to the widow's house. Get my point? Mm -hmm. Elisha was at the, the river eating from the ravens and drink that riverbed dried up. Some people sit there and they're like, Lord, cause it with abundance, cause it to flourish. But see, the Lord said, go over here. Well, we're gonna, I'm going to look at this story real quick. But where did I tell you to go? Oh, a five. Yeah. John 5, and then we're going to look at the Elijah thing, another verse that we're going to close. John 5, Can you 31. take a little more? Yes. Yeah, All right. John 5, 31. No, by, no, 539. 539 says, he says, um, you search and investigate and pour over the scriptures diligently because you suppose and trust that you have eternal life through them. And then he goes on and say, but these are very scriptures that testify about me. See, these people went over the scriptures. These were the, the Pharisees and Sadducees. They studied them, but they couldn't see Jesus. And still you won't come to me. See, here's the problem. They can be in an atmosphere where God's word is read, but they don't come to Jesus. They don't know him personally. Yeah. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. They're religious. Yeah. He says, you don't come to me so that you'd have life. I don't receive glory from men. I crave no human honor. That's why I like amplify. I look for no mortal fame. You see that? But I know you. And you recognize and understand that you have not the love of God in you. He goes, I have come from my father's name with his power and you do not receive me. Your hearts are not open to me. You give me no welcome. But if another comes in his own power and with uh, no, no authority but himself, you will receive him and his approval. You see that? How is it possible for you to believe? How can you learn to believe who you are? Are you, when you're content to seek and receive praise and honor and glory from one another, you do not seek the praise, honor, and glory which comes from the Father alone who is God. Come on. Is my point made? Mm -hmm. You hear what Jesus said? That is amazing. Jesus said, look, man, if somebody comes who has no authority whatsoever, meaning how do you know if they have authority or not? Well, their authority comes from God, comes from the word, and comes from their accountability. So he says, if another comes, you will look for their recognition. You will receive the approval from the unapproved. But he says, how is it that you look for the approval from the unapproved instead of looking for the approval from the approver himself? Which is the Amen. father of God. Amen. 
Amen? So a lot of stuff gets put in order when you and I know who we are in Christ. When we know that we're accepted in the beloved, we're holy without blame. Come on. Yeah. Uh -huh. Amen? Now look at this. Go to Philippians real quick. Oh, no, no, no. Let's go back to Galatians. And then I'll read the, I'll read the, uh, the other one. I mean, uh, Ephesians. I'm sorry. Ephesians. Where's the other one? Look at this, Ephesians 4 tells us, verse 14, so we may no longer be children, we may no longer be what? What's a child like? Well, if anybody wants to know what a child is like, just ask somebody who raised kids or somebody who has a kid now, right? Uh, Patrick here has a child. Would we put Sebastian behind the wheel of this car and just tell him, go ahead? Would we? No. He's not mature enough. He says, so you're not tossed like ships to and fro. I'm not going to finish the whole verse, but verse 15 tells you here. But rather, let your lives lovingly express truth in all things. Speaking truly, dealing truly, living truly, and folded in love, what does it tell you? Grow up where? In all things, into what? Is, does it, is it talking about just grow up naturally? Or is it talking about, that's right, grow up into him. And what does that mean in the hymn? It means this, real simple. Grow up into the mindset, purpose, mentality, and the way of Jesus. Speaking like Jesus, talking like Jesus, thinking like Jesus, acting like Jesus. This will take us a life, won't it? Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you one thing. Jesus, one thing, as Christ says, we're talking about approval and validation. Jesus never found his validation and approval in humanity. He didn't look for the unapproved to approve him. Did he? That's why the Bible tells you don't love the things of the world for all that's in the world. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the of life. The reassurance the reassur re assurance in one's own giftings and resources. We shouldn't be assured in anything except him. Nothing wrong with enjoying life. God wants you to enjoy life. He tells us that. He gives us all things, you know, to richly enjoy, to be blessed. But don't find your validation and approval in it. Don't be more confident because you drive a Lamborghini than you do a, a Volkswagen. I mean, uh, I'm just going to share, I'm going to share this as we go to second team real quick. Look at this. There's a big, there's a thing I like. There's a big old guy. Now, this isn't a good commercial. And some people think that's gross because I've heard people say it. There's a guy. He probably has to be like 59, 60 years old. He's super suntan. He's like a total midlife crisis dude. He has a gold chain on, a big pair of those old blue blocker glasses, hair kind of missing in the middle, but out to the side. Has a Rolex watch and a belly like that, but he's all suntan. Get it? You probably know this kind of gentleman, right? You know what I mean? You know, they're kind of like, you know, they pull up their hair's dyed and they got like a Corvette or a BB and they're looking for them. <laughs> so anyway, this guy, so this guy, this commercial show, it's, it's a liquor commercial and he has a pair of Speedos on. <laughs> and man, I don't know, no, actually he's American. And he's got like a hairy chest, you know, so you can imagine what he's and he's just walking down the beach like this. <laughs> and I saw that commercial and I thought, I don't even want to use the word I I didn't think gross. I thought, man, that boy, that, 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 that. See, his identity and approval wasn't in the gut. He didn't have a six pack. He, there was a lot of black going on in that man's life. But something. He had what they call swag. Swag. That brother's like. <laughs> I'll play the video. It's man, I love it, man. This show. He's not what you know most people are looking for. Here comes this ripped up 
six foot two handsome, you know, guy with all his hair, you know, this, bro, I mean, so you got to remember this. What's more attracting is real confidence. Real confidence. Real confidence. It's more attractive. You know why? Because it's eternal. It's something inside coming out. It's not something outwardly making it up. You get my point? It's not, you know, I've, I've been to, you know, Tiffany's and all the high end. Nothing wrong with that, man. Nothing wrong with those people. But it's something emulating out, oozing out. It's not something you can buy in a store and just go, man, give me some of that. I'm, where would you buy that at, man? I want one of those. You can't find that. <coughs> So it's 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 prayer, right? It's precious. Now look at seventeen. Same. Let me change my shirt. Second Kings. You weren't sharing on Second Kings today, were you? No. I don't think so. Might get in a little prosperity here, but here you go. Just look at this. Second Kings. Uh, seventeen. And it says, uh, um, uh, verse three. And it says, uh, go on eastward, hide yourself by the brook near the Jordan, the brook of Chirin. I say, Kedon, it's Chirin. And it'll be Second Kings seventeen, verse four. And it'll be that you're going to drink that brook, for I've commanded ravens to feed you. And he went and did according to the word of the Lord. Blah blah blah. Verse six. And they brought unto him flesh in the morning, bread, flesh, all these things. And it came to pass after a while the brook dried up. Because you know there was a drought going on, right? Because there had been, oh, first kings, my apologies. I said so, first kings. So there was a drought, right? And it says, you know, God called for a drought. Okay, and there's a drought. Then the brook dries up. There be no rain. Verse eight. The word of the Lord came to him, saying, "Now rise, go on over to Zarephath, which is in Zidon, and I've commanded the widow to sustain you." Okay. <clears throat> Sorry about Not too cool, right? So here's the point. Like I said, when you're on God's system, you follow what He says. <clears throat> So following in faith is important, right? Mm -hmm. It's not it's not bucking the system. It's doing. It's following. It's partnership. It's commitment. But really, it's it's a confidence knowing that God is faithful to His word, to His vow, to His partnership. God is in it. So then you see right here, He says, "Go on over to the widow's house." So verse ten. So he rose, went to Zarephath, and when he came to the city gate. There was a widow grabbing sticks and he called to her and he said, fetch me, give me some water in a vessel that I can drink. And she was going to fetch it. Uh, and as she was going, he said, now bring me a, a morsel of bread. And, and, and she said, well, as, the, as God lives, I got only a handful of meal and a little oil and I'm gathering two sticks. I'm going to dress it for me and my son. We're going to eat it and die. Now, here you go. I want to show you something. When the Lord said, go to a widow's house, I'm going to sustain you. Don't you think he was thinking, I've been at this brook. I've been eating the raven's meat and the bread. It's time to be promoted. He's thinking, go to the house. He's thinking, it's time for an upgrade. So when he gets there. He says, hey, grab me some water, man. I'm thirsty because the, the, the river bed's been dry. Amen. Mm -hmm. And she says, look. And he says, By, while you're at it, I'm kind of hungry. Let me get a little meal. And she goes, you know what her response was? Just listen. Look, man. I only got this. And, and you're not including it's just for me and my son, and we're about to expire anyway. So this is what we got left. Now imagine the prophet. He's thinking, hold on a sec. You told me to go to the widow's house and I'll be sustained. 
Now what I'm encountering on the earth is not what you said. It's lack. It's scarcity. It's she only got enough for her and her kid. Hold on a second. Man, did I miss God? Uh, I better go back to the riverbed. I bet you get my point. Mm -hmm. It happens to many people. And, and she only has a little bit. But you told me abundance. God, you're God of abundance. So Elijah, thank God Elijah knew. He knew the nature and the mode of God the Father. And he says, Elijah said to her, don't you be afraid. See that? Thank God Elisha knew God. If he didn't know the Lord, he's going to start questioning, like I said, debating with himself. He's going to go back to the riverbed. He's going to start blaming God. He's going to get mad at God. Come on now. And say, don't, don't be afraid. Fear not. Go and do as I said, but make me a little cake first and bring it unto me and then after for you and your son. Thus says the Lord, the barrel of meal shall not waste me, the crew will drop till the day the Lord sends rain. Now imagine this woman at this point. It is an amazing story because at this point he says, I want you to go make for me first. She don't even know this man. She doesn't even know him. It's not like he came in and said, hey, look, I'm Joel Osteen. You saw me on television. Make me a cake first. You get my point? He comes and says, make for me first. And then for you. Now, if she was like most people today, they'd be like, um, excuse me, sir. Preacher stealing from the will. Mm -hmm. But see, because she had some awareness of the provision and the power and the will of God, she was able to act on the word. She put herself in that, as we talked about earlier, that sacrifice, sacrificial moment. And look, and it wasn't just for a meal. And it says, she did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and her house ate many days. And the barrel of meal did not waste or the crew fail until the word of Elijah. Now I want you to see this. I'm going to hurry up. Look at this. I'm not even going to talk about the prosperity. She had one meal that became many days. She had one meal that she could have ate. Ate it all up and that was it. But because of her faithfulness to the word of the Lord and to do, she had many meals for many days. But that ain't even the main crooks of the story. The main crooks of the story is right here. Verse 17, and it came past after these things, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And the, his, his sickness was so much that the, there was no breath of life in him. And she said unto Elijah, what have, what have I to do with you? O oh, man of God, did you come to call my sin to remembrance? So obviously she started thinking something was going on in her life. So that tells you that God works with sinners still. And he said to her, give me, he said, give me your son. And he took her out of her bosom, put him in a lock, and he laid him on his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord all night, has thou brought this evil upon this woman with whom I'm now slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried, O Lord, I pray. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and his life came back, and he was revived. And then she says, I know that the word of the Lord is in your mouth. That's it. I'm done. My point is there was a whole lot more to the story that her sacrifice, her compromise, her partnership, her, her, her life overall presented a fact. Look, whether she ate that bread with her son and they died, it wouldn't have mattered because this was coming down the road anyway. You understand? This was coming down the road, you know? And God already foresaw that, that a miracle could happen in her life and in her son's life based upon her response to him over a little morsel and a little crude oil. Even though she had some form of sin, you know, which we don't know what it was. The Bible never tells us. But the Bible, the word, look at, can I just say this? Because Maria's going to see God. Think about this. Think about this aspect. Out of all the people, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's good, Lord. 
How many of you remember in Luke 4? Remember Luke 4? Yeah. Everybody look up here real quick. I'm going to not let you. That's it. I'm, not, I'm not one to get all like super spiritual and go, I got goosebumps. But that word just flowed up out of me. And I was like, dude, I'm home where I got goosebumps. But I'm not playing it by that. But <laughs> that verse, I just saw it in flash form of spirit. Remember in Luke 4? When Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and they didn't believe who he was, and he said, That's all right. There were many widows in the days of Elijah, yet to none of them was Elijah sent except to the woman, the Sarepta. There were many. Just think about this. There were many widows. And God sent him to a woman with a little bread and a little oil. There were many that had more provision that Elijah could have went to and just, they would have already had everything in the storehouse. But instead, God sent him to this widow woman's house who didn't have but a little bit, who probably had some condemnation in her mind over her own sin, which probably left at the same time her son was raised up. Right? There's a whole gamma of stuff going on there. Her personal guilt, her personal condemnation, a little more so, a little oil. Uh, her son's about to expire. You know, there's a whole lot of things going on there that God already foresaw. So God sent, come on, man, can't you see that? That God sent her a provision, mm -hmm. which was Elijah. The word, God brought the word to her house, to her life, mm -hmm. to not only cause her to flourish and eat many days in the middle of a drought, mm -hmm. preserve her son's life, mm -hmm. probably free her up from all the bondage she was in. God saw that and brought it. There were, Jesus said there were many widows in the time, but he didn't go to none of those except this one. Kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah very Because you know who God was for? The obedient ones. Right, right. The right. ones that are going to respond. Elijah could have went to many of those other little women's houses. They would have been like, not going to work. But he went to that woman's, and for some reason, she was obedient. She was yielded. She was given to the word in his mouth. And she acted on it. Amen. Praise God. This message was brought to you by Living Water Fellowship San Francisco. You can connect with us on Facebook or email us at sflivingwater.com.